I think I'm like two minutes. It doesn't have to be long. I have an issue. Yeah, the pair. The pair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then walk out and put me in the back. Okay. Just that one. Yeah, that one doesn't work. Seriously? What's the matter? How about that? Okay. What, what was that, that work? Did you do? So that's funny. It's so the arrows. The and arrows now the arrows work. work. Okay. <laughs> we are clicker challenged up here. <laughs> All right. Yeah, we're going to get started. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> so I'm Greg Kaminsky. I work with online learning at Portland Community College. And my teaching area is ESOL, which I've done a lot of them in the past. Uh, though right now I'm teaching a, a reading course of reading 115 class as a hybrid, as a PCC. My name is Megan Savage. I teach writing and literature at PCC. I most frequently teach creative writing, fiction writing, and um, technical professional writing. I teach online and face-to-face -face and hybrid. <laughs> um, and I've taught composition and children's literature in the hybrid modality. And I served as one of the hybrid mentors. You'll We'll hear a little bit more <laughs> in a minute about what that is, but that, that's I'm here in that capacity today. Yeah, and um, that's who we are. <laughs> Obviously, this is a roundtable session, so just to kind of let you know what our general thinking was, we're going to tell you a little story about uh, something, sort of how hybrid has developed over the last couple of years at PCC, um, our experiences, and then we'll have a good chunk of the session to hear from you. And obviously, um, we want to hear from you throughout, too, if things come up or you have questions. Um, but we thought we wanted to start out. Let's hear about their role, though. Yeah, like yeah, go ahead. So how many, how many instructional designer uh, online learning support do we have here? Yeah. Okay. okay. Administ administration, all right, as well. Uh, faculty, how many? Good. Excellent. And how many of you have uh, already taught or designed and taught a hybrid? Okay, okay. great. Excellent. We right. well, have a good discussion okay. today. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so um, we thought we would just start out again. This is a round table, so we want to make sure it's interactive. So we thought we would take a couple minutes to ask you to turn to someone near you and just have a brief conversation, a um, couple minutes long, to think a little bit about your experience in your own institution and, and maybe talk through that to someone. So if you're talking to someone from your institution, you can kvetch together. If you're talking to someone outside your institution, maybe take a moment to think about what, what are some of the issues at your institution that most most commonly support or undermine student success in hybrids. If you want to talk bigger picture, what's going on with hybrids at your institution, right? Um, and when we talk about these issues that support or undermine, it might be issues related to students, faculty, or they might be institutional issues. And then also, if there's anything, think through, is there anything in particular that you want to get out of this session or that you'd like to accomplish today? And then we'll hear back some of these that'll help us direct our focus. So just take a couple minutes, introduce yourself. <laughs> We want to ask, we certainly want to ask, uh, follow up on anything you want to get out of the session for two. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll get more get into that at the end. Yeah, it's good. Yeah, mm -hmm. Next slide. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right. Too bad about these. I do. I do like these. Um, I don't like being tethered to the yeah. computer. Yeah. But it's at least there's two of us. us. So yeah. So we can bounce and back and forth. <laughs> Greg, I'll make a couple notes about number two, since we don't have a whiteboard that I would write on. Okay. I'll just jot down a couple notes so I don't forget. Okay. <laughs>
take 30 seconds to wind yourselves down here. That's interesting. Yeah, so kind of interdisciplinary work and whether the hybrid supports it. Okay. Yeah, and you're already doing that face to face. Well, I'm not. I'm teaching a different class, but I'm interested. Oh, yeah. Okay. Bruce? I'm interested in the, you know, we've always had a hard time when we set them down trying to figure out what's a blended, what's a hybrid, you know, let's get a definition so we can stick there. I'm just curious in how other institutions can that. Yeah. Really, yeah, we spent a year on that. Yeah. We're going to speak to that for sure. <laughs> so, you know, I'm, I mean, we're still yeah. struggling with it. Yeah. 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 So I think um, this is good. So I think if we take some time to kind of tell you about, like Greg said, our journey, and that will cover some of these things from definitions to working with faculty in a ton of different disciplines. And then it sounds like there's a lot of great expertise in the room. So then we'll kind of turn it over and folks can. Yeah. Later, and if we don't get to your questions, we can just bring them up again. Mm -hmm. or, or see it afterwards as well. So a little bit about Portland Community College. There, we have four main campuses plus the online. And about 70,000 students now. That's down from I think about five years ago. It was about 93,000. Uh, and so it's 25,000 FTE right now. This term, uh, about 5,400 course sections and hybrid. We have about 5% about of those are hybrid classes. Online, 700. Um, Really, the, the norm for online is about 20%, and so I'm not sure it's how these things are tabulated, but about 13% of the fall term are online. Normally, yeah, the online part's a pretty pretty hefty chunk. Normally, uh, a fifth of the course is high, uh, online. Classroom, yeah, 4,400 then. But uh, the scheduling of hybrids is, I just wanted to mention, mention that, it's really through the department, department and department chairs. There's no college-wide coordination of the scheduling of hybrids at all. It's really by campus and by department and, and chairs and dean and who would like to they'd like to try a hybrid uh, at that point. So there's uh, as opposed different. to online. Yeah, right. so the online is quite different. It's much more structured, than, uh, much more college-wide. 
collaboration and an annual schedule guide for the online courses and how many sections can be offered online. And so, which is relatively new, just in the past year or so, gotten more into the coordination of that. So in terms of hybrids, I started about 21 years ago at PCC, and, and my initial function was to help instructors create hybrid courses. We had a few, maybe five. At that time, we paid for them. We paid for the development of the hybrids. Uh, I checked them in terms of the quality. We used QM as a, well, not, not a 98, but uh, shortly after that, in the early, early 2000 era, started using QM to review some of the hybrids even. Um, we designated them in a, in a schedule as a CL Web. Anyone heard of that one? You haven't heard of that one. Right, Bruce? That's <laughs> something here. Uh, but CL Web is Classroom. Classroom Web was the idea. Yeah. If you may guess, that never took off. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, it never really caught on. It was always confusing. Because a lot of instructors would designate their courses CL Web if there was any web component. So even if it was a fully face-to-face -face class, but students turned in assignments or checked their grades online, then it became CL Web. So you had both hybrids and non-hybrids with that designation. Right. And I want to mention that eventually my role shifted really completely over to online learning because the hybrids, they were not all that successful at that, at that time. And work and the demand was online and so yeah, that's where I went. So the online side. Hybrids did continue though. So the CL web did continue. People did what they want with them pretty much. <laughs> there was really no oversight. And, and in fact, yeah, Megan, if you could click on that. Yeah. 150 ways to note hybrids in the schedule. <laughs> so CL web, hybrid, blended. And we have in our schedule a, a separate area that an instructor can add a, a Oh my gosh. Describing. <laughs> Um, okay. Let me try to make it big. It doesn't, yeah, yeah. it doesn't matter. You can see uh, uh, the different different ways. So hybrid course meets on campus. Uh, students required to do work outside. Hybrid two hours, two hours online. One lecture. <laughs> Some of them from Microsoft online. Office. Faculty <laughs> faculty just put in what they would like. Oh, wait, can I just point out, this one just required an orientation. So, oh, <laughs> that's <yeah>. it. <laughs> the rest of the course was online. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Once for the orientation, and that was the hybrid, and that was the online, and the rest was online. So, that's how it was. Uh, no icons in the schedule at all to show the hybrid. So, confusing in terms of registration. Then, support was very, very limited, random. And I also, I already mentioned the, the scheduling mm -hmm. uh, and the evaluation of that. Yeah. yeah. And then we hit this moment a couple of years ago where there was this sudden push for hybrids, right? Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that at PCC. There, there's been an enrollment decline that Greg mentioned. Um, one of our major buildings on the Sylvania campus, the HT building, where a lot of our classes are, is going under a multi-year construction, so we're losing all this classroom space. Um, and then a uh, Friday Academy, somebody came up with the idea, somebody, Greg knows who, <laughs> to have a kind of Friday where you can come in one day a week and take multiple hybrid classes, and it's this kind of cohort model. Um, and then also just in general at PCC right now, there's a lot of concern for access and accessibility and how hybrid classes can support that, knowing um, how busy our students are, how beleaguered they are. Um, and there's also a big drive towards culturally responsive teaching, which if you don't know what that means, it has to do with taking into account a student's cultural background and your own cultural background as an instructor um, to really have more personalized learning. So things that have come up across this conference about teacher as facilitator, student-centered instruction, really valuing a student's prior experiences. All of those are aspects of culturally responsive teaching that kind of dovetailed with thinking about hybrids, how hybrids can be a flexible way to connect with students. Um, but that said, we were really noticing that a lot of the kind of rationale behind ooh, the push for hybrids <laughs> was 
uh, structural, right? <laughs> so, okay, the classrooms are under construction, students like flexibility, teachers like flexibility, right? Some of you I know have already even just in brief conversations talked about how hybrids make your lives easier and better. And all of those are, you know, really important material considerations, but we realized that, of course, missing from the conversation was the learning <laughs> and really thinking about how to make a hybrid effective. I'm sorry about, I don't know. <laughs> the, the ghost keeps jumping the slides, but um, yeah, how to how to create a hybrid um, and not just make courses hybrids for structural reasons, but really to be intentional intentional about how we create hybrids so that they're serving the learning, the discipline, the course itself, um, the teaching, and the the students. And so that led to the creation of a hybrid work group. That we're just so a couple talk years about. ago, we got uh, a group together made up of deans faculty, online learning staff, and we were charged uh, with exploring hybrids, benefits, challenges, and to make recommendations. We took a year for this process, so for example, the definition is one of the important ones, just trying to focus what we're doing with hybrids, trying to offer better support. Uh, we had surveys for faculty, surveys for students, really looked at the benefits, challenges. We talk to uh, 17 different institutions. I think some of them are represented in this room. I think I spoke with one of you, I don't know. Um, <laughs> collected information about what folks are doing and then drafted the recommendations and sent them on to the Academic Affairs Council. Resort resulted in a 13-page report. 35 recommendations is what we had there and you'll have access to the whole list of recommendations, so you can take a look at that. They really focused on how we define and characterize hybrids, uh, communicating hybrids to students, so making sure the students are aware of what they are getting into, streamlining the approach to hybrids, and support for faculty and students. So just trying to rein things in, tie things together. We did get an administrative response uh, after that year, and, and they thought, uh, yeah, this is this is good work, good information. Let's focus on on these uh, twelve recommendations uh, for the next year, going into the next year, for example. And we, so that's what we did. Uh, they chose the items that that we could do with very little funding that we did not have to apply surprise. To funding. <laughs> yeah, and, and that was a good part. We understandable, so we were able to focus on those and as well. And we punched that a bit. We did, we both, we did uh, maybe 16 instead of 12, and so we added a few that we really just couldn't avoid. Then. Yeah. And then my email back to them was apologetic. Apologetic. We just couldn't uh, avoid doing these as well. Included a few more. So we established a the work group continued implementation group, and then created a hybrid faculty mentor program as well. And the implementation group. Let me just go ahead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There we focused on the, the definition uh, immediately, and we came up with with this, which is, I believe, the definition very similar to what OSU uses. A hybrid course meets in person and has online work that replaces some in-person class time. The amount of time spent in person and online varies between courses. The in-person time is noted in the schedule. Greg, maybe can you speak to why we chose hybrid over blended? Because we did have that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. And I think part of that was from just our, our feelings about it, what we preferred. Actually, initially, I think I preferred blended. I really kind of wanted to use that term. The 17 colleges that we spoke with, 16 of them were using the, the term hybrid. One was using blended. And blended seemed to be used more at the university level. So, for example, University of Central Florida, University of Wisconsin, those are the big ones. They were all, they were using blended. And, but uh, community colleges, other institutions I spoke with were using hybrid. And it just seemed to, to make, make sense for us to adopt that term instead. Greg, was there any, any talk about presenting components for examinations that was on campus? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, yeah. And just, as you notice, the definition does not include that at all. There was a lot of talk about that. And it was included in the notes uh, before, not the notes now. But 
Right. And what constitutes a hybrid. And we ended up with really between 25 to 75 percent in either direction. And and so that was the, and most of the hybrids are 50-50, uh, but it's pretty common to have 25, 75 in either direction for that. When it goes below that number in either direction, then you really, we told them, okay, it's possible, but you need to have a conversation with the dean, pretty much clearance the dean for that then. And in fact, this definition is only for students. This is our student-facing definition of students and everybody, but we have another one that we realized this wasn't enough. Mm -hmm. and, and it was not clear enough for faculty mm -hmm. and admins and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we did have an expanded one, which you can find in the, the report. We didn't put it here because it's very lengthy, actually, mm -hmm. and it does include those percentages that you could go 75, mm -hmm. 25, um, and have a conversation about that. Also, that it, it specifies that the hybrid needs to have reduced seat time, reduced mm -hmm. class time. A hybrid, and, and really to the effect that those two experiences are integrated, classes integrated. So it's not just mm -hmm. come to class if you want to, if you want to do the rest online, you can. Yeah. Uh, that doesn't work. Because that, yeah. And, and that was one of the reasons that we added the expanded definition because I had a few faculty come to the workshop said, oh, yeah, this is great, and, and my more mature students, if they just want to do this at home, they can. Uh, well, yeah. Okay, yeah. It's an online class that works. Online. And a lot of people who came to the workshops really didn't understand, even still, people who were ostensibly teaching hybrids and getting training on that, that reduced seat time was one of the things that made a hybrid a hybrid. Um, a lot of people were talking about flipped classrooms, and in their mind, the flipped classroom and the hybrid were sort of the same. So the definition was really key, and the extended definition, too, in order to get everybody on the same page, <laughs> just baseline, <laughs> before we worked on the training more extensively. Yeah, yeah. Right. Good. I wish we had a bigger screen. I am. Or maybe I just need to put my glasses on. So, <laughs> uh, so one thing we did, the main thing we did in our schedule for students is to, uh, so two things. So we added this icon, which is, so people in a classroom and a computer. So that's a hybrid together face-to-face, -face, so classroom. So we did this for all the classes, which is nice. It's clear for students, just with the icon, classroom, online, completely online, and the key up at the top then as well. And we also added the notes for the hybrid. Put in a standard note here, online and face-to-face -face requirements. And that's really all we're allowing in that area right now. So no more 150 options. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and then for Anything more specific, uh, the instructor should be communicating to that uh, that's a student ahead of time mm -hmm. and through email and other other areas. Um, good. Okay. And a link on that previous slide, that previous page actually goes to this one uh, as well. So information to students about the expectations of clarifying the hybrid expectations. And there's more on the page. It's from a web page. Uh, but trying to clarify the typical hours per week needed for a four-credit course, for example, mm -hmm. by different instructional methods. So an online method, yeah, it's a face-to-face -face class, um, the in-person meeting, online instruction, and then still adding another eight hours, up to eight hours of homework uh, on top of that. And then the hybrid, so the combination of the campus and the in-person experience for the, the hybrid. The problem we're trying to solve here is, you know, the experience that probably a lot of you have had as hybrid instructors that students end up kind of conflating the online time and the homework time, the, all of the independent work time, and just thinking a class meets face-to-face -face is the class, and then everything else is homework. And gosh, this class has a lot of homework, right? So trying to really clarify those differences for students. this link. Um, yeah. So this link goes to uh, one of our... I will try. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> on our website. So trying to clarify information for students uh, about what hybrids are, hybrid classes, are hybrids right for me, talking about time management skills, and what is required, and 
Yeah. And then they have access to a start guide for online learning. That's our main orientation for online students. Optional now for hybrids. They didn't used to be able to even take that. It wasn't allowed, but now it is allowed to take that. So that's good. And you can scroll down just a bit. And that's... Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then we have so, our, our time. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Okay. Oh. Okay. Yeah. So in the next slide, so hybrid faculty mentor program. Okay, we were fortunate enough to receive funding, President's Fund Award for twenty-four thousand to uh, have hybrid faculty mentors uh, work on training, work on materials, work on our hybrid course template. So we selected six mentors then, and so. Megan is one of our hybrid faculty mentors, and in addition to being on the, the hybrid work group and implementation team as well. So it's a combination of full-time and part-time instructors, district-wide, business, English, Native American studies, economics, biology, geology, so we we're really trying to get a mix of different disciplines. Yeah. So the faculty would have support, they could choose to work with a mentor who was in their discipline or on their campus, who would have a sense of the needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we worked on the, the hybrid template design and the training design and facilitation and uh, trying to promote awareness, awareness among the faculty as well, what good hybrid course design entails, that it's not just uh, letting them go for the extra hour of class and not do the work at home, uh, but a really planned integration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the hybrid template that Greg talked about, so in our, we use D2L for our LMS and all online courses have accessible templates that come with them. We just transitioned to face-to-face -face classes using D2L too, but the templates within um, the face-to-face -face classes are not so accessible. So the hybrid <laughs> courses were this middle ground, right? So we wanted to create a template um, that would include things like uh, the syllabus template that was accessible and that included language or, uh, that had to do with face-to-face -face versus online versus hybrid modalities and what expectations should be. We wanted to include um, a few different examples of schedule templates that could be used, and I'll, I'll show you some of these. Um, we wanted to include draft some welcome letters and have some of the hybrid mentors share some of their resources and materials. Again, the idea was not that we were giving everyone um, you know, stock language that they had to use, <laughs> but rather to remind faculty, here are some of the best practices and what you need to communicate with students in a hybrid class because the ways you communicate with them may not be what you're used to if you're used to teaching face-to-face. -face. If you're used to teaching online, you might be more familiar with these uh, issues like accessibility. Mm -hmm. um, so the hybrid learning orientation module, Greg talked a little bit about that. We included videos by the hybrid mentors um, talking about things that we learned as we started hybrid teaching. We included some of our syllabi examples so you can see what syllabi in a range of disciplines look like, um, the syllabus and the schedule. Uh, Greg, do they have access to the yeah. template? Yeah, uh, at, the, at the end, uh, you'll, you'll, uh, show, we'll show you how to access the template and also you'll receive access to that. Yeah. This is just an excerpt of um, the kind of thing that's in the template, which is an announcement that would go on the home page of the course so that students could see, as soon as they get access to the course, what the tasks are for the first day. So if you have a hybrid that meets later in the week, for example, the first week of class, you're probably expecting students to come to class prepared, having done certain things, and students aren't used to that. So <laughs> we were trying to come up with a template for the kind of email that you could adapt to your own class and discipline, but that you could post on the home page and also send out to your entire roster, maybe even a couple of times <laughs> before you actually meet face to face, knowing you're not going to get 100% completion, right? But at least, hopefully, some of the students will be further along and you don't have to kind of start the Friday class meeting of the first week you know, a little bit behind because nobody's done the online portion of the content. Uh, this is an example of one of the templates we used for the syllabus. 
We really talked about how to, or the, sorry, the course schedule, and our goal was really to help students understand, again, that relationship between course content that's online, <laughs> what you have to do to prepare for a face-to-face -face meeting, and then what you do after. So I'll talk more about the integration piece in a little bit, but this idea that um, the content they're viewing online, what's happening in the classroom, and then what's happening after the classroom meeting are all kind of connected. Oh, sorry, I'm gonna show you that later. I'm talking about the wrong slide. <laughs> this is actually, comes from the syllabus. We showed you earlier that table about the expectations of labor. So we thought, let's be transparent with students. Let's put that in the syllabus and not just talk about it amongst ourselves. So that's that. Um, this is the schedule. <laughs> so this is actually from Greg's course. So you can see prior to class, here's what students are expected to do online. They meet on Fridays, so during the week before they meet online, do these things. Then here's what's going to be done before, or this is what's mm -hmm. going to happen in the Friday class In the class, class. In, in the, the class. class, right. And then mm -hmm. after class, doing this. So. This is both um, for you as an instructor and for students to be kind of bearing in mind, it's not just a list of assignments, but how the materials unfold over the course of the week, online and face-to-face, -face, bouncing back and forth. And in the template, we actually put three different types of schedules that instructors could use, different templates, and this is just one of them. Wow, that just changed know, on, right? on its own. I mean, and you know, one of the things that really came up across the workshops that we held is how different your courses can look if you're meeting earlier in the week, if you're meeting later in the week, if you're some, I mean, I was just talking to someone who meets once every two weeks right, for a longer period of time. So really being intentional about how that structure relates to the content and then communicating that to your students. Mine was a bit of a Experiment really uh, meeting on Friday as opposed to meeting on Tuesday. So I, I really didn't want to waste the whole week. So I really wanted to get them in. And for the most part, for the most part, it worked. Uh, there were cases where the students really weren't checking email and and didn't know didn't know about it. And but so it was not a foolproof plan. Um, we held a number of workshops with faculty district wide um, over the course of two terms. And these were opportunities to work on best practices for teaching hybrids and to help faculty kind of work on their own courses. So we created the workshops as a hybrid. <laughs> so there was online content, there was an online discussion that faculty entered, they shared something, we went in there and talked to them. And then they came to a face-to-face -face workshop. And of course, it was a great modeling example, about 50% of the people who showed up had actually gone online. <laughs> so we can talk about how to handle that or address that. Um, we used Kahoot at the beginning of the workshop, which is a, a quiz tool, a survey tool, to quiz them on um, something, they, a video they viewed online to kind of model how we want to integrate the face-to-face -face and the online. So kind of starting out immediately saying, hey, let's talk about what you did online this week. <laughs> let's talk about that thing and, and refresh your memory of that. Um, we really focused on defining the hybrid, like I said earlier, best practices for design and delivery, intentional design, and I'll show you some examples of planning documents we worked on. And some of you went to panels already, I know about um, instructor directed teaching and instructor presence in the online environment. So we spent a lot of time on that. And then again, this transparency, how we talk about hybrids and how we communicate them to students. This is one of the tools that we used in our workshops, the mix map. Have any of you used this? No? Okay, yeah, a couple of you. Um, Greg, where does this come from originally? Uh, let's see, so I believe this one, the idea is from OSU, and so CubCon at OSU uh, runs their hybrid program and uh, has, is an excellent approach. The integration piece was, I think, the most critical piece we worked on, and some of you have asked about that, but how you make decisions about what in your course content you're going to present online, what is face-to-face, -face, and then how they touch, so you don't have kind of two parallel courses running <laughs> where students feel like, wait, right, you know, there's no instructor in the online portion, but then I see my instructor once a week, and what do these two things have to do with each other? So the mix map is a way of zooming out and saying, okay, as I'm planning my course, here are the kinds of things that I'm always going to do face-to-face, -face. here are the kinds of things I'm always going to do online, 
and, and here are the touch points or here are things that will show up in both ways. And just to give you an example, like an assessment, um, some of our faculty ha come from programs where um, certification programs where assessments have to be proctored or, or viewed face to face. So they knew they had to do certain kinds of assessments in the classroom. Whereas for other faculty, it was an easy thing to say, I'm moving quizzes online, so I don't have to take up time where we're all together in a community to, to waste on quizzes. So this is a big picture way of thinking through, okay, as a whole in my class, how do I want to make those um, divisions and those connections between online and face-to-face? -face? And then for folks who are further along or for folks who had already done that work, starting to really break down week to week or outcome to outcome, <laughs> how those outcomes unfold. Um, so starting to identify, say, outcomes or topics in week one, the learning activities and assignments that will happen then, um, if any assessments are happening, what those look like. And then for each of those projects, starting to say, well, should that be online or face-to-face? -face? And then, again, critically, what's the integration? How, how does the week one content integrate? Where are those points of overlap? So to give you an example, one of the mentors, Tiffany, is an economics instructor, and she had her students doing a lemonade stand simulation online. It's not something I've done. <laughs> but they, you know, they, had, they spent a week doing the simulation to make, make choices about how to run their lemonade business and see the effects of that. If anybody has done this and I'm mischaracterizing it, let me know. Um, <laughs> but basically then, they kind of took a survey about that and they came in face to face and they talked about their approaches with each other and they really broke down how it went and what was successful and you know, kind of zoomed out and learned from that experience. So it's not two separate classes. They see the connection. They see the integration of the two is the key idea there. <laughs> I mean, and again, what does integration look like? We put this video in as kind of a funny break in the <laughs> presentation, but it ended up being a really great conversation starter, right? <laughs> so <laughs> what if the cats is online? What if the cats is face-to-face, -face, right? <laughs> so you're constantly ping-ponging back and forth in a hybrid class. And on the one hand, you really want to keep that ping-ponging in mind, right? That's a good practice. But on the other hand, you don't want your students to be confused kitty having no idea where the ball is, right? <laughs> Just focusing on that. So we ask everyone to visualize what integration looked like in Easy. your class, right? So for your class, for your content, not in a generic hybrid, what does it mean to integrate face-to-face -face and online? And we ask them to think about um, different kinds of representations. And everybody had really different examples of how they could represent this with students. One was the kind of, this was a religious studies instructor who had the kind of yin-yang example. He hit the um, space bar. The two hats example, an ESOL teacher, you know, you'll wear this hat uh, part of the week and then this hat another part of the week. Um, Paul Montone, who's an online mentor at PCC, he said he thinks of it as a ski slope. So basically, the analogy is that when he's in the class with his students, it's like the lift, <laughs> and he's really guiding them and taking them up. And then, so he meets them earlier in the week, so he really sets everything up and supports them. And then they get to ski down the slope on their own. Again, it's saying they're not just on their own or lost, they're having fun, they're zooming through, they're doing guided activities, and they're exploring and engaging in a fun way online. And then, I think this was a psychology <laughs> instructor, this optical illusion, I can't remember what it's called, but the base, so it's the same class, but you're looking, and then you're looking at the content in a couple different ways at once. So, I, and with that came the elevator pitch. Imagine that you have a potential student who wants to take your class, could you give them a 60 second elevator pitch telling them why the course is a hybrid? And again, not <laughs> because we only want to meet once a week. Because <laughs> it, you know, it's good for me and you that we only see each other once a week. <laughs> but how does hybrid modality work for your content? And maybe those images are a way to get you there to think about it for your class. But how do those two modes complement each other to foster student success in the class? Hmm. And um, this is just one other way of kind of thinking through those questions. Again, Tiffany, the economics instructor, she put together this diagram, um, and she actually included it in her syllabus to show to students, and it's really breaking down the labor. So this is independent student work over in this area, and here's independent instructor work, like preparing course materials, grading, feedback, and then the overlap 
is when the students and the instructor are together. It's instructor directly teaching time. But some of that is face to face and some of that is online. So making clear that she's with them in the online mode. And here are the kinds of ways she's hosting and responding to discussions. She's reviewing videos um, and what they're doing on the online mode. Practicing problems, surprise quizzes. Right? Mm -hmm. So again, she did that partially. She started off doing that for herself to say, what does my labor look like, my contributions, what does their labor, what does togetherness look like? But then she shared it with her students so they could see that too. Yeah, and this is from Eric Salahub, who did a presentation for innovative educators about hybrid teaching. And uh, Eric works at Front Range Community College, so that's patterned after his project. All right, so a few key resources you'll be able to tap in later. So hybrids at PCC, that goes to our hybrid page. We made use of Katie Linder's book, The Blended Course Design Book, Practical Guide. And it's, it's an excellent book, so you should get a copy uh, for yourself. We have, a co we have copies for instructors to use as well from our project. Blended Learning Toolkit, Kelvin Thompson. I bet many of you have already looked at that. Hybrid Learning at Oregon State University. We actually used a couple of the tutorials that Cub designed. So if you click on that one, it'll go directly to those two tutorials. They're only 16 minutes and a and, uh, good introduction to any kind of hybrid workshop. For instructors, so to get them going, get them thinking about it. Um, so yeah, I just mentioned Eric's hybrid teaching webinar. Uh, webinar. Uh, if he does that again, that's a good thing to, to uh, check out. And they have some in additional resources, some links that I won't go to at the moment. Key outcomes for the project. Uh, there's another work group report for you to look at if you're interested. <laughs> and so that's the most recent one. It's, that, uh, I think it's only about eight or nine pages instead of the 13, that one. Um, they, keep, they kept wanting me to scale it back, scale it back, take this out, make it concise. So, all right. But we addressed most of the outcomes that we were trying to address and a few more, mainly dealing with so the sustainable steps that we took, schedule designation, as, as you saw, student awareness, consistent template design of the course, and some support resources are sustainable that we have. Not sustainable, so the training that we did for faculty, that's gone, that's done, because our mentor program is over. Most of the mentors are still there, but we're not funded anymore, so. Yeah, right, this and is the one-on-one -on -one design guidance. I can help them occasionally, yeah. but not any big project anymore. You know, I forgot to say this about our workshops. So we had this face-to-face -face workshop, and then the next move was for anyone who attended the workshop, if they were moving into design phase, they could schedule a one-on-one -on -one consultation with any of us, and we really worked um, more specifically on their class. Should I take this first slide? Yeah. So some feedback, key takeaways uh, from faculty who took the workshop. <laughs> Uh, make sure the online and face-to-face -face parts of the course are well integrated. Okay. Uh, really important. Yeah, blend the online face-to-face -face work deliberately. Don't end up with a Franken course or the fake hybrid. So those are terms used by the OSU, by Cub Khan and his. Uh, so the Venn diagram visual then. And, and then to establish this, this appropriate flow between the online and face-to-face -face, so that, that ping-pong model uh, approach then. I think a couple of my students are the ones on the side watching the action in between. And I, but that's always going to happen, I suppose. Then. A lot of um, the things that I found as a mentor, I was really excited. One of the reasons I wanted to be a mentor was um, having taken face-to-face -face courses and translated them online and having taken hybrids, made hybrids out of both face-to-face -face and online courses. I was really interested in how that helps you um, kind of reevaluate your own pedagogical tendencies and your habits and really rethink your teaching practices so that you're doing what works best. So I pulled out some reflections that I thought were kind of speaking to the fact that a lot of the people who attended these sessions were doing just that. So someone who realized they need to be less rigid in their methodology to make this work. Um, someone who used to just be totally anti-discussion, but then was rethinking the discussion tool, thinking about how the discussion tool could be a touch point between online and face-to-face. -face. Um, someone who was uh, self-reflecting that they realized their class is basically online with a few face-to-face -face meetings shoehorned in, and they really need to think through how to make the best use of that precious face-to-face -face time. 
um, by using it in new ways. And then one of my colleagues um, said I appreciated this. She had originally thought of hybrid as just new cool tech. <laughs> you know, there's all this new cool tech we have to learn. And now she's really realizing it's not just about throwing lots of new cool, new cool tech into your classes, mm -hmm. that's hard to say, mm -hmm. um, but really carefully crafting the course and, and rethinking her teaching modes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I feel like that, that's a really good, yeah. Right, so now where are we at now? The current status, uh, we have much better modality awareness among the students then, so that part is in place. Hybrid faculty mentor program has ended, so that's gone, that's a thing of the past, although in my report I did lobby for it and the administrators are talking about what to do next. The workshop videos are available, so we did take some snippets. We did uh, some of the workshops, most of them face-to-face, we did do uh, three of them online, so they were virtual workshops for, for the three hour period. And they worked, they worked pretty well, actually, and, and we took some snippets from those to make available. So the implementation report has been submitted, and we are waiting, <laughs> waiting, waiting for the administrative response to see what happens, to see if there's any funding to continue the hybrid mentor program. Uh, so we will find out. And, yeah, at the end, we'll come back to that, but, so. Yeah we, yeah, we had originally put these questions, there's some of the kinds of questions we asked you at the beginning, but I wish I had a whiteboard, <laughs> you know, I would have written, because I think the two of the most important things I heard from you all are, how do you teach hybrid, and what are some of your best practices, um, or it's anything that's interesting or maybe different from what we've talked about, about the way you approach hybrid, and then uh, interdisciplinarity is also a big thing, right? And then um, I think the question, your question also spoke to how do you make choices about what to put online and, and what to put face to face. So I don't know if anyone has any thoughts or wants to speak to that, but we'd love to hear from you. Do you want to take a couple minutes to think about it? Yeah, many of you are have taught uh, hybrids a lot, and so we'd really be happy to hear any anything you'd like to share things that have worked for you uh, in your class that you'd like to share with the others, that would be terrific, uh, or other, yeah, any strategies you'd like to share? Well, I'd, I'd like to, uh, for one, it's nice to hear from you all about, My students actually have challenged me to rethink that. For example, um, I thought face-to-face -face discussion, videos offline, and work. And what I found is students are, well, wait a minute, the initial post discussion online because they can reflect, have better, um, more, better responses, and then that connection piece to class. So now I do the initial post online, and then in class we can follow up. The other piece was um, some of the videos with the online. I can't show all videos across. I wasn't going to show any because I just thought they wanted to listen to me. <laughs> but, but they really did want to have at least clips and have a discussion piece with some clips that highlight key topics, key concepts. So that was the other piece. And um, let's see what was the. They wanted can, to do that in the class. They did, the clips. Of it. Can I ask, so they wa would watch a video online and then you'd pull well, a clip from that video? So I had, a, had the class totally online, so I did have a set of videos that I did, they had used of that, and I thought, oh, they can just watch those on their own kind of video. And then I, they saw that I really helped just do a clip, you know, a couple minutes mm -hmm. of a key, key concept, mm -hmm. and then we can expand the kind of lecture discussion around that work. Mm -hmm. But I guess the challenge that I'm still struggling with is <coughs> Choosing because um, what I don't want to do for my courses is that they're getting two full classes. So yeah. they actually have like twice the amount yes. of work they have to do because I'm just so excited to have them. Yeah. You know, so it, uh, that choosing of balancing of what works better face to face and what's not, and that's that's my ongoing. But it, it's actually made my face to face better mm -hmm. because now we use Canvas and there's so much that you can do with Canvas, and it's made my totally on. I'm supposed to I'm just really excited about it. I think the whole rethinking my course being outside the box and making it love the word in a 
integration of making all the all the modalities of singing this. Yeah, My class uh, needs some. Okay, go ahead. Oh, just sorry, mm -hmm. super briefly, because that was one of the best things I learned as a hybrid mentor was. I have a tendency to, oh, there's online. I can throw all these extra resources on there for students who have the time and learn. Yeah, it's too much. So that editing bit, I think, is really That was important. a learning curve. Mm -hmm. Like, your first students. Yeah, it's really interesting. Some, some students, I'm, I'm checking to see how much time they're spending, and, and some are spending, oh, okay, it was about two to three hours for the week, and, and others are up to 20 hours for the, for the week, and great variance. And, and some of them are just not watching the video. Not doing it, that's always a and potential maybe they issue. Don't need to. You know, the things that I've been like, like in the old days when you just had this yeah. video. Well, the like, ones I'm getting are pretty important. But, yeah. <laughs> and my classmates on Fridays uh, should be meeting right now, in fact. Um, but they're doing a voice thread instead. They're, they're hopefully they're experimenting with that. <laughs> they're experiment. yeah. uh, but I have them do uh, discussion. They have to post by Wednesday in the week. and. Then it was, uh, okay, we talk about it in class, but then follow-up posts due on Sunday. But this week I'm, I'm switching that around, having the replies due on Thursday, so just for the next night, so that they do get in and read some of what the others have, have posted already. So we're trying to enhance the Friday morning discussion even more, potentially. Do you have a comment here? Having built all of my, built, like, started new and build a hybrid, it's harder than building an online or face-to-face. Because you have to think, this will be qualifications. This will be new like standards for face-to-face. -face. But the finished product, I have found, is just so much more successful. From my perspective, but the student feedback is to be much more positive. And I have students who take off, who take an online course, and they and it become that, the hybrids say, oh, I didn't realize hybrids are so much more. But they get more information from me in a hybrid than I can provide in an online course, but the information comes from you. Because of that face-to-face. Face-to-face component, absolutely. Absolutely. And I found, and it was an experience, and that I found that I should always start my face-to-face -face class on it, reviewing last week and this week's online component. Mm -hmm. So here's the discussions you had online. Here's what's talked about that, that, that. Here's what you're going to do on this week. This is what it means. This is clarification. And it took me a little while, but I had found that if I put the do at the very end of the week, a personal reflection, I'm the only one who sees it, where well, they get to reflect on that past week, I will now really kind of brought the two elements together. And if I start to see that it's not, I need to do just something. But their personal reflections on my aha moment, or this is what this has to me, et cetera, for me was the thing that helped me, where I test the waters to see if I'm still balanced. It's a good idea. That's a great idea. And I'm, I'm collecting a participation log. Oh, okay. Reflection as well at the end of the week, just like that. So okay. you can reflect on what they've done. And all that stuff. It's a good measure. It's really helpful. Good idea. Other thoughts, other ideas, strategies? I just, I, I'll speak while you're all thinking. <laughs> I'll speak to that again just to say one of the things that um, I like about the hybrid modality is there's a certain kind of flexibility in there that you sometimes don't get in a fully online class. So or in some ways in a fully face-to-face -face class, so when, if we have snow cancellations or yes. things like that, I can kind of make on-the-spot decisions about the modality. But on the other hand, because there's that adaptability and, and because students are switching between modes, doing something like you suggested, always starting the face-to-face -face class in the same way, always having a reflection, having certain um, things about your approach that are very consistent and that you're very clear with students about can important way to get them into the rhythms of the class. Yeah. So other questions that came up earlier, so the, the culinary as well, yes. connection, uh, <laughs> yeah, I think it'd be, it could be great, it could be worth a try. I think that uh, the factor there, one factor with, it depends on the, a lot depends, as you know, on the motivation and time management skills of the students. Are yeah. they ready? Are they ready for so much online work or not? Right. And, and that's so that's a question that I think about. And I know in my class, yeah, a lot of the students were ready, they're ready to go, and they're doing well. I think it was a learning curve to get into it. And there were a couple that were just added to the class at the end because there were no face-to-face -face courses available, and they needed it. And it's not working out so well. 
for them so, because they're not they're not ready for it. They weren't like, ready. Could I clarify what I was thinking too? Yeah, yeah. I'm just wondering the pieces where because it's so practical and so concrete, and there's all these like you know, processes and steps. So I'm wondering how that part. You know, would you just do videos of those? Like, what's the, you know, how well does that work for people doing like book tech, where there's all this specific concrete stuff, like, you know, steps and processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody teach mm -hmm. hybrid in book tech or CTE program? I think being able to see it first, even on video format, means dividends. That's a because it all they give an idea at the very least. They come up with a concept. They understand the concept. That's it. surprising sometimes how these new actual skills the students will pick up just by viewing. But then when you see them face to face, they say, "Oh wow, you're getting it already." So there's that aspect, and it does help from my perspective. It gives you more time to ask those who either didn't look at the video mm -hmm. or saw the video, but somehow the visual learning component of you say learning wasn't there, so you can help them. Right, and I think maybe it's how it only helps when it has a little cat in there. Oh, yeah, so sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. Think about the components that, that just really wouldn't work online. It couldn't be online. Yeah. Uh, that would really have to be in the classroom. Yeah. Yeah. But also remember that students don't have to be doing things with their classmates to be having peer-to-peer -peer interaction. So, for mm -hmm. example, um, in a technical writing, I have students write in a set of instructions, and then they have to use their test. Them and watch someone try to carry them out. But, you know, it just seemed way too complicated to have to have a classmate do that because they are located all over the place. So they can use family and friends and co-workers and, and so, yeah, and use like your resources. Virtual tours and things like that. Yeah. You can send them on all kinds of Yeah, exactly. Thanks. So all of you can get into the the work day of the class, uh, have access to the workshop that we gave, the online part of the workshop. And uh, and also to the hybrid template as well. And so you can see what we've done with the course information and instructor resources. It's mainly the first few modules, those extra modules, that you'll see a difference. The rest is just same as the online template. Uh, nothing nothing in those from, from modules one one on, actually, or two on. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so you have access to that. Feel free to take a look. And feel free to use anything that you'd like as well, if you'd like to, so we're happy to share. Yeah. And uh, get back to us with any questions that you have. And I think, I think we're, we're running. Are we about out of time? No. Yeah, we're about out of time. So thanks for coming. Keep talking to each other. <laughs> Please. No, there's no. And this is, this is why it's not supported. No fee. There's no additional fee for the hybrid classes as, as yet. You know, the only thing that's a question I always get is if they use the same, this is more than tools that an online student's paying for the bus. Right. So, how? It has been proposed. I know it's been proposed, and I know they're talking about it. And we've tried that too, but I, I don't want to waste the fees. I don't even like to see that. Yeah, no, it's it's one of the options under discussion. Where's the money going to come from to support the hybrid program? To support it, yeah. Right, good. Thank Thanks. you all for coming. Right. Eighteen. That's a good number. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Much more than the Surprisingly five five hundred yeah. yeah. They just didn't sign up. They yeah. didn't choose on the calendar. Yeah. They didn't like the trailers in the room. I'm planning to try that. My colleague tried and couldn't get in. Oh, no. oh. He tried from his phone and from his laptop, so just doesn't. Tiny, just, this one? You yeah. tried this one? Yeah. Could I come see? Let me see. Are you trying right now? Um, it wasn't me, it was my colleague. Yeah, I'm getting a general page, but I'm not working. This is what I'm getting. That's one of the choices. Yeah, I got a couple of things. Well, that was really good. Yeah. 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 Y